the way I think that these things work really well is as more of a casual chat than a formal presentation. But having said that, you know, just to go over some of the basics, and I think it's a great idea. This is a, a very important topic um, because uh, when you go to your Parkinson's disease physician uh, or mid-level provider, whomever you see for your Parkinson's, it's really important to, to come armed with uh, specific questions. And there are several reasons for that. One is because Parkinson's affects so many different um, aspects of someone's life and someone's body, and both are important. Two, a lot of people may not be as familiar um, on the provider side, but also on the patient and caregiver side with some of the things to look for, um, many of which can be treated. Uh, but if you don't ask for them, or if you don't present them to the physician or mid-level provider or other clinician, then they won't know that there's a problem and they won't know to treat it. So the way I like to kind of divvy this up is into two different bins. One with the movement symptoms of Parkinson's, the other is the non-movement symptoms. And both are important. Especially as the disease advances, the movement symptoms, of course, are, are obvious and progressive, but people don't always pay as much attention to the non-movement symptoms, at least in the, in the clinical side of things. Yet, if you look at the data involving Parkinson's disease, it's the non-movement symptoms in the more advanced stages of the disease that are actually more problematic for patients and for caregivers. And yet, they still can be treated, at least many of them can. So it's really important to, to think through the movement and the non-movement symptoms both. Now on the movement side, obviously every Parkinson patient is different. It's a heterogeneous disease. And even as the disease progresses in one patient, it can have many different movement symptoms. The classic being tremor, stiffness or rigidity, slowness of movement, as well as unsteadiness with walking. And those are, should be at least relatively obvious to the patient caregiver and the clinician. And so I didn't want to focus quite as much on those today, rather on the non-movement side is where I really wanted to focus. And in particular there, there's a very good um, questionnaire that I would encourage everybody to fill out and take with them every time they go to see their Parkinson clinician. It's, uh, it's called NMS Quest. That's N is in Nancy, M is in Mary, S is in Sam and then QUEST stands for questionnaire. It's a published uh, questionnaire that's been validated, meaning it does a good job of capturing the data it's asking for, that was developed by a researcher in Parkinson's disease and published some time ago. And if you Google NMS questionnaire or NMS QUEST, you'll be able to pop it right up. And what it does is it goes through a series of questions all on one sheet of paper that are all yes, no questions. And they focus on a number of the key different non-movement features and important in Parkinson's, ranging from, are you having drooling? Are you having nightmares that you're acting out your dreams? Are you having constipation? A, a whole host of different non-movement symptoms, mostly focusing on those that we know can negatively impact quality of life, negatively impact function, and increase caregiver burden. And those are all important areas. And again, if you look at the data for the, this questionnaire, on average, in patients with moderate to advanced Parkinson's disease, they are going to have seven to 12 of those questions answered yes. And so that means if someone's not asking each clinic visit about all of these types of questions on the non-movement symptom side, on average, there's gonna be about seven to 12 symptoms that are important to the patient, yet are being missed in that clinical encounter. And so the good thing about the NMS questionnaire is it gives the patient a tool. So some patients uh, see movement order disorders doctors, some don't, some movement disorder doctors pay more or less attention to non-movement symptoms, but this makes it easy for you to take control of whether these are things that are bothering you. And if so, it gives you a tool to give to your clinician, say, here are my non-movement symptoms. You can see the ones that I've checked. Yes, these are the things that are bothering me. Let's discuss them. And again, it's important uh, because there often, uh, not always, but often are ways to address a lot of non-movement symptoms. There are ways to address cognitive symptoms, mood symptoms, blood pressure symptoms, 
uh, lots of different medication and non-medication options to try to address these symptoms. And they can clearly have benefit, uh, not only for function, but quality of life. And as the disease progresses, the accumulating um, burden from the movement and the non-movement symptoms both really can negative, negatively impact quality of life. And so making sure that you take this with you every time and don't let the clinician off the hook and just take a look at you and say, oh, your tremor looks okay. Yeah, your walking's a little slow. That's your job to then say, here's the form. I filled it out. You can put it in my medical record. I wanna go over these things. And uh, if they're not aware of those things, then you're educating them and it's their job to figure that out and remediate their education or if they are aware of them then they can start thinking through how to address them not only just with medications but there are often non-medication ways and sometimes when you do this then the clinician thinks to themselves you know what maybe i do need to partner with a movement disorders specialist or a cognitive disorder specialist or a cardiologist or a psychiatrist depending on where the symptoms are that can help them figure out how they need to supplement their care for you with other subspecialists, depending on the type of symptoms that you may or may not be having. So that's really what I wanted to focus on today was continuing to get the word out about the importance of non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's, recognizing that there's an easy way through that questionnaire. There are other questionnaires, it's just one good example to do that and fill that out every single time. The patient and the caregiver can both fill that out. You take that with you and it gives a very structured way to interact with the clinician taking care of your Parkinson's to think through, are all of my non-movement and my movement symptoms being appropriately addressed? And it looks like we may have one question here, uh, or is that just you, Sarah, um, with the link? That was me posting, but somebody actually sent me a question yeah. and they said, I've heard of something called the UPDRS. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's a good question. The UPDRS stands for the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. So it's an acronym that describes the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. And what that is, is a very structured way for the clinician that you're seeing to look at a lot of the key movement features not the non-movement features, but the movement features in Parkinson's. Usually when people refer to the UPDRS, they're referring to part three. There are four parts to the UPDRS. The part three is the one that is most commonly referred to, which is the structured examination that the clinician does to qualify and quantify tremor, stiffness, slowness, problems with movement and problems with walking at a bedside examination. Then parts one, two, and four focus more on questions, some of which include non-movement symptoms. And so that's another way to utilize that. Um, and they focus on, are you having other types of movement symptoms, some types of non-movement symptoms? And so all four parts together comprise the UPDRS, but when people refer to it, they usually mean that part three, which is the structured examination to look at movement symptoms in Parkinson's disease. And we, I use that every time I see a Parkinson patient. And that way I can compare over time, how are the movement symptoms doing over time? How do they compare to the patient or caregiver support? Because we only get a snapshot of your movement symptoms at the bedside in the clinic visit. And that's good, that's okay. But what really matters is how you're doing in your day-to-day -day functional life. So if you have on the UPDRS, you only have, for example, mild tremor but in your day-to-day -day life, that tremor is really impacting you, your function and quality of life, well, that's important to recognize and not just rely on the examination. So it's a good tool. It's a good tool to try to objectively track patients' movement symptoms over time, but it's not the end-all and be-all. It's just another tool to add to the puzzle of what your Parkinson's disease looks like over time. That's really that's really helppful. Um, the uh, uh, this. Next question must be from a care partner. It says, um, how do I deal with the fact that I see different symptoms and I don't know how to bring that up with a doctor? Yeah, yeah, so this is a common issue, first of all. Uh, so I'm glad that uh, a caregiver asked about that because it, it can be kind of tricky. If the patient says one thing and the caregiver is sitting there looking at me and shaking their head, I would say that occurs more often than not. So recognize that you know, you're not alone in this at all. 
Number two, it's also important to recognize that sometimes patients genuinely don't recognize certain types of symptoms. And the reasons for that are not clear. Dyskinesia is one good example. Dyskinesia is are the extra movements that patients sometimes have after being on levodopa for a long time that you've seen Michael J. Fox, they're kind of a dancing, writhing-like movement. A lot of times patients won't have the insight that they're actually having those movements. It's a phenomenon in neurology called anosognosia, where someone doesn't have the insight to recognize a neurologic symptom that they have. Why that is is not clear. That it occurs is very common. And that's just one example. And that's why I always ask in any discussion um, with a patient, I always ask the caregiver what else they see in addition. And you should never be hesitant because you're not telling on someone, you're not disagreeing with them. Uh, the, the goal is to get as much information as possible about what the patient is doing when they're not in the office. And of course, the caregiver is gonna be very important in that particularly because, as I just mentioned, in Parkinson's disease, it's often the case that patients may not recognize for a variety of reasons any number of symptoms that they may have. So a good way to do that and an objective way to do that is to have the caregiver and the patient fill out that NMS quest and fill out some other online tools that you can find about movement symptoms, and you bring that to the clinician. And that way, there's no back and forth, there's no disagreement. It's just, here's my assessment of what I've seen. Here's your assessment of what you've seen. Let's try to put all those pieces together and figure out what that means. And I'll tell you that that ends up being very important as the disease progresses in particularly, because sometimes patients either minimize some of their symptoms because they don't want to be a bother or are somewhat concerned about symptoms and don't know how to bring them up. And so you actually do the patient a service by knowing that you're there, you're watching what's going on too, and we're all part of a team trying to help the patient. And that, in my experience, really helps to mitigate any potential uh, conflict uh, that can occur. Uh, and I would also ask the clinician that's helping to treat the patient. It's good to bring things up with them. Hey, I'm seeing some stuff that perhaps the, the patient isn't necessarily seeing. How, how should we deal with that and, and bring the clinician in so it's not just a you versus the, the partner. It's you and the clinician and, and the patient all together trying to figure things out. That makes a lot of sense to have both people kind of fill that out. And it's also a, it's a nice communication tool so that there can be continued communication about the disease because it, it does change. So that, that's a great, that's a great idea. Um, so somebody said, I see a neurologist, but not a movement disorder specialist. Can you tell me the difference? Sure. So movement disorder specialist is a neurologist who has extra training, what's called fellowship training in um, movement disorders. So neurology, so the way medicine works is you go through medical school and you get your MD, then you go on to residency, and that's where you can become a general medicine doctor or a pediatrician or a neurologist. And then you can go on and get even more training to subspecialize within a particular residency field. So you can just be a general neurologist and practice general neurology, or you can go on and get fellowship training in movement disorders and be a movement disorder neurologist. You're still a neurologist. You just have extra training specific to movement disorders. And the reason that's important in Parkinson's is Parkinson's is the majority of what movement disorder phys neurologists see. So the whole point is they have subspecialized training specific to Parkinson's that a general neurologist doesn't necessarily have. That doesn't mean that a general neurologist can't do a good job of treating your Parkinson's. It just means they don't have that specific training to qualify themselves as a movement disorder specific neurologist. And often what happens is early in the stages of disease when symptoms are relatively uh, mild and easy to treat and there aren't quite as many symptoms, patients are often followed by their general practice physician or, or a general neurologist and will partner with, for example, on an annual visit with a movement disorder neurologist because there's not, not a lot going on. But then as the disease advances, it's nice because you already have connected with a movement disorder neurologist and sometimes you end up transferring your care away from the general neurologist or the general practitioner over to the movement disorder neurologist, especially as there's more and more movement symptoms, 
more and more non-movement symptoms. And in theory, that's where the movement disorder neurologists should be of most help because they have specialty training and all the different stuff that goes on in Parkinson's. They also will likely have access to clinical trials, which some patients are interested in or other research paradigms. And they should be uh, much more specialized in how to apply current medications to that particular patient's disease. So that's where kind of on the spectrum of things for, for treating Parkinson's lie, from the general practitioner who's not even a neurologist through to the neurologist who has exposure to Parkinson's but is not specially trained in Parkinson's on to a movement disorder neurologist who has specialty training specific to Parkinson's disease. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that. You know, we can't um, emphasize enough the importance of having a movement disorder um, specialist in your treatment team. And even if you don't live where there's a, a movement disorder specialist nearby, you know, like you said, even once a year, just to make sure that you have a person who has that in-depth knowledge. And we often hear people talk about, you know, kind of feeling a little guilty if they're going to switch their physicians. And um, our favorite phrase is that you are not cheating on your other doctors by seeing a movement disorder specialist. Um, no, not at, all. not at all. And, and in my experience, frankly, it's been quite the opposite. Most, uh, so number one, there aren't a lot of movement disorder neurologists. So if it were up to us to see every Parkinson patient, you would never get into our office because there's too many. So that's not an option. So what can we do? What we often do, especially at a place like Barrow, where we see patients from, from all over the world, we'll partner with a local physician, sometimes not even a neurologist, just a local general practitioner, and we'll provide the kind of driving the boat. Here are the things that's going on now in the disease. Here are the recommendations that we have to try to address those things. Here's the plan over the next year or so with feedback provided both by the patient and the general uh, physician or neurologist locally. And then we partner with them. And, and then as things change, we change with them. So the care is executed through the local physician but is guided by the movement disorder physician. And it, and it ends up being for specific reasons because there's a lot that goes into determination of medications. There's over 20 different medications that are available now. Uh, there are more and more that are gonna be FDA approved. Then you have to talk about deep brain stimulator surgery, carbidopa, levodopa, intestinal gel, uh, other types of neurosurgical procedures, all of which are expanding continuously. It gets really complicated. There's a reason to specialize in Parkinson's disease as a neurologist. And there's no way a general neurologist can keep up on all that. No matter how dedicated and hardworking they are, they're treating lots of other diseases, whereas a movement disorders neurologist isn't. So we have the benefit of not having to worry as much about all the other stuff. We can really focus on the Parkinson's stuff. And in theory, we should be providing the scaffolding that the general neurologist or general practitioner can then fill in uh, based on our recommendations. And in my experience, that partnership works really well. I have very rarely run, run into circumstances where there was an antagonistic type relationship. It's almost always the opposite. Oh, great. That's great. Please provide that. I'll give you the feedback. And then if something emergent comes up, two different sets of eyes are looking at it, including someone locally who knows what's going on and knows what our thought process is, and we can communicate about it. Thank you. That's really, that's a, a, a helpful, I think that's a helpful framework. It's, it's sometimes difficult to do that for people, but it, it really is just so important. Um, I have another question that came through, and that is, it seems like my husband always does better on the evaluation than I see at home. Why is that? Yes, yeah, so this is a common issue. Uh, you're not alone. It's almost like someone puts on a show uh, when, they're, uh, when they're at the clinic. Uh, and so there are several reasons for that. One is a lot of, from, for example, from a movement standpoint, uh, outside of tremor, particularly the slowness of movement and the walking, a lot of that revolves around the decreased spontaneity of movement. The automatic nature of movement is lost in Parkinson's. Having said that, you can compensate to a certain degree for that lost automatic or habitual movement nature. And that's really what, if some of you folks have gone through big and loud, that's really what that treatment focuses on. It's how do we use what's still working well in the brain from a movement standpoint and engage that so that the patient does well. And those require 
exaggerated movements, augmentation of, of uh, automatic movements. And that's basically what you can see. So when a patient comes into the office and they're moving their arms better, they're upright more, they're, they're focusing on their posture, they're focusing on their walking, that's all because there's still a lot of the movement networks in the brain that are there to be used. They're just not as automatic. And so it's very common that you'll see that. And then when someone's back in their day-to-day -day life, they're not as focused on it. And so they're relying more on the automatic movements and those automatic movements are lost as part of Parkinson's. But that's the flip side of that. Is that that's also why big and loud and other types of physical therapy can be so important in Parkinson's disease. Because if you do make those, you, if you do not rely on the automatic nature of movement, but rather you augment that with an overt effort with your movement, you can counterbalance to a certain degree some of the issues, particularly when it comes to the, the amplitude of movement, the arm swing, the leg swing, and the posture. Those are things that can respond if you put the effort in to a certain degree. Wonderful. Um, I'm just going to put it out there. Those are the questions that I had coming to me. If anybody else has any other questions, let me know. I do want you to know that we have movement disorder physicians listed on our website, like Dr. Uh, Walsh is on our website. Um, we only list movement disorder physicians on our website. Um, we don't list general neurologists. Um, and so if you're looking to contact Dr. Walsh or any other movement disorder specialist, you can find that on our website and then you can literally click, click on that and it'll take you right to the doctor's site. Um, and we try to make it as easy as possible for you because it's really important um, that you have an easy way to connect with um, physicians. Is there anything else as you think about people kind of preparing for their their first appointment. So obviously that, you know, whether they think they have Parkinson's or they've just recently been diagnosed and they think about preparing for that first appointment and it can be so overwhelming. Um, so the movement disorder, um, uh, the movement disorder, um, uh, non-motor symptom questionnaire that you sent out that you just referenced that's one way is there anything else that would help people kind of organize that overwhelmed experience that happens when you really start down this journey yeah absolutely so there are a few things to consider there one is you know, write everything down so uh, think through what your questions are think through what your concerns are and write them down and bring that with you to the appointment just like you fill out the questionnaire write whatever questions you have down. And then the, the obvious question there becomes, well, what questions should I have? Well, the great ways to, to kind of start to wrap your mind about what is Parkinson's is you can go to the National Parkinson Foundation website or this website or the Michael J. Fox Foundation website. And there are a lot of tools out there to explain what is Parkinson's, what is tremor, what, and, and, and there are even some tools on those websites that indicate what questions should I ask my physician. And, the, and so you, the more prepared you are to come to the visit, thinking through what is the disease, what should I expect, uh, do I have it, wh why do you know I do, or why do you know I don't, uh, those are all very reasonable questions, and just write them down, go through them with your caregiver as well, and think that through and come prepared to the appointment, and then check the boxes as you go through those questions. And the other reason that's helpful is that if you do that and come to the appointment armed with that, you're gonna get a feel really quickly if that clinician has a good handle on Parkinson's or not. And that becomes really important because then you gain confidence or lose confidence that that's the right person to be working with over what is inevitably gonna be a long duration of symptoms and a lot of different stuff is gonna happen. And you wanna to start to gain confidence early on that yep, this person's on the ball, they, I'm clearly not uh, giving them any strange questions, they're interested in answering them, their answers make sense. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes both ways. It, it empowers you uh, to get through the questions that you have that are important to you during the visit, but it also gives you a chance to see, does this person seem to be on top of what Parkinson's is and is not, both of which are important, uh, and then you can build a rapport based on that. Thank you. Um, uh, there was a question that came in, how do I deal with my husband's apathy? Yes. Um, if you, if you have an answer to how to deal with your husband's apathy, let me know. It's, it's a tough nut to crack in Parkinson's. And this has been looked at extensively over a long period of time. First of all, it's a very common symptom in Parkinson's disease. 
And it's always hard to know how much is apathy and how much is what's called akinesia. So the lack of spontaneous movement is a fundamental property of Parkinson's disease, and that's called akinesia, lack of movement. Now, that can look like apathy. Someone is sitting there and has a bit of a blank stare on their face, isn't moving, and doesn't go and do stuff. Well, that can be for many reasons, because of the akinesia, because they're rigid, because their medicine isn't working. There are very legitimate reasons that they may not be apathetic. They may be having physical symptoms that limit their ability to do stuff. Now, if you remove that from the equation and say that's not what's going on for a given patient, then you look at mood disorder symptoms. And mood disorder is part of Parkinson's disease. Depending on the studies that you look at, anywhere from 60 to 100% of patients uh, who have Parkinson's have mood disorder mood disorder, typically either anxiety or depression. And in depression in Parkinson's disease, a big component of uh, depression in a number of Parkinson patients is mm -hmm. apathetic depression. So depression is classically sad depression, which is the most common form where patients really feel down, they feel sad. But there's a subset of patients that instead of having so much sadness, they have apathy, loss of interest, loss of motivation, loss of get up and go. And that is, uh, it can be difficult to treat, but it also tends to be multifactorial. Some of it inevitably is gonna be from damage to parts of the brain from Parkinson's that causes mood disorder. And that can be treated with the standard treatments that we use for anxiety and depression. Usually serotonin specific reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs like uh, Prozac is one example. Zoloft is another example. There are a whole host of them. And they can be very helpful uh, and are usually very well tolerated in Parkinson's and can be very effective in Parkinson's disease. But apathy can also have many aspects. It can be because not just the, because of the, the loss of serotonin as part of the disease, it can be because of loss of independence, it can be because of worrying about the future, it can be because of a lot of different factors. And usually it's multifactorial. Some of it's gonna be from damage to the brain and nervous system from the disease, some of it is gonna be from the, the overall context of the disease, and you have to try to treat both. And so what I would recommend is having a frank discussion with the patient as well as the patient's treating clinician that this is a symptom that you've noticed. We know it's a very common symptom in Parkinson's. It usually is multifactorial. Are the different factors being addressed and how do you address them? Typically, we rely both on the medications for depressed mood, but also often on psychotherapy as well as in considering what are my daily exercise regimen? What are my daily activities? And again, getting away from the automatic nature of stuff and relying on more effortful structured stuff to get people going again, just like you do with movement, same thing for mood. And it usually it's a combination of medication, psychotherapy, and a structured either um, a hobby, um, a daily structure, a structure to the day that gets the patient up and going uh, so they don't have to do it spontaneously, it's provided. It's 10 o'clock, I'm supposed to be doing this. It's 12 o'clock, I'm supposed to be doing this. So there are ways of trying to address that. And usually it takes all of those different ways together to optimally treat apathy in patients. I think you just um, helped to demonstrate exactly why it's really important to have those kind of discussions with your doctor because you just explained that it's normalizing, it happens, it's sure. not something to be embarrassed about. And you no. just you just demonstrated how important that is to be able to, to share those things. Yeah, and this is why, you know, coming to each clinic visit prepared with, here's the non-motor symptoms, here are the motor symptoms, this is what we're seeing, what, uh, what is really bothering us and triage things. So you can, because the clinician is going to be thinking, okay, there's a lot going on. You can help them by saying, you know what, the tremor's there, and yeah, it's annoying, but you know what's really problematic is the apathy. If we could do that, uh, if we could deal with that, then we, I, I think a lot of the other stuff would get better. And then that really helps the clinician say, okay, well, I'll worry about that tremor, but then at the same time, let's really focus on this now, try to treat it, see how that goes, and then we can revi revisit the other issues, and then you can help the clinician in triaging based on what really is going on in your day-to-day -day life that's causing problems with function and quality of life, that's what they need help focusing on because then that helps them think through the next steps that they should be taking. That 
that makes perfect sense. And I think I've heard people talk about, um, you know, that embarrassment that they have. I don't want to bring it up. I don't want to disappoint my doctor, um, you know, and while we, while we might say that and it might sound unusual, I, I think of, you know, when do you go to the doctor and hop on a scale and not think, oh, I wish I could like just lose 10 pounds before I hop on the scale. Like we all have it, um, wanting to please people and especially people that matter. And you get, build such long-term relationships with people um, because of the nature of the disease state. But it's important to, for patients and caregivers to understand that you know, that's not their job. Uh, they're, 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 it's the clinician's job to please you. And, and I don't mean that in a, in a uh, flippant way. I mean, what I always ask my patients is, are your symptoms treated to your satisfaction? And I mean that in a very specific way. Some patients were really bothered by tremor, and then I'll have patients that are sitting there tremoring away, and they're not bothered by it. And that's the key, is what is it that's bothering you with your Parkinson's? And that helps me focus in on, okay, then if that's really bothering you, we should be thinking about this, 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 and this, and then come back to see if we've addressed that enough. So that's why if you're going in armed with, here's my motor symptoms, here's my non-motor symptoms, and this is what's really bothering me in my day-to-day -day life, that guides that, that interaction you have with the clinician to result, hopefully, in a meaningful outcome that's going to try to address what's really causing problems related to your Parkinson's that's bothering you, not just the tremor, stiffness, and slowness that the clinician happens to see when you're in the office, because then you're not really getting the whole disease treated. Thank you. And there's one more question, and that is, there's no cure for Parkinson's, but are there ways to treat some of these other symptoms that can really help me? Yes, and that's why it's really important to write all of them down. Uh, so in some respects, there is more we can do for non-motor symptoms in certain patients than we can for motor symptoms. And that's why it's very important for them to not go overlooked. In addition to that, some of the non-motor symptoms end up limiting uh, the medications that we can use for the motor symptoms. So that's another reason that it's important. And then added on to that is sometimes the motor symptoms are exacerbated by the non-motor symptoms. A specific example of that is tremor. If you have uncontrolled anxiety or anxiety that's poorly controlled, that often really gets tremor going. Well, what, you, what will happen if, if you're not telling the clinician that I'm anxious, and they just see the tremor, they're going to be piling on more and more anti-tremor medication when that's not the problem. The problem is that you've got uncontrolled anxiety, it's driving the tremor, and lo and behold, when you take care of the anxiety, tremor can quiet down on its own, and you didn't even have to go up, or not as much on the anti-tremor specific medication. So that's why all these things interact, and they all interplay, and if you're going to treat the whole Parkinsonian patient, you have to be thinking through all of those pieces together, including what are the therapeutic options and how will they positively or negatively impact the movement and non-movement symptoms? And so that's why if you start that conversation coming into the clinic and visit armed with, here's my motor symptoms, here are my non-motor symptoms, then that fundamentally changes the direction that conversation is going to go with the clinician. And it's more likely to have an outcome that's desirable, meaning doing something about your symptoms that's meaningful for you because absolutely there's usually quite a bit we can do, particularly on the non-motor symptom side. That's wonderful. And the tool that you provided is fantastic. Um, we will include that in our next e-news and we'll include a link to this for people that weren't able to join. We also put this on our YouTube channel so people can go back and replay this. I think um, I'm really grateful for your time today because you really helped to explain the complexity that happens when you go in to see your doctor and when you're doing an evaluation with a with a patient it's one thing to think that i'm just doing you know simple what might be simple or you know movement um tests with you but you're looking way beyond that um and i think that's really helpful information for people to know that that's that you that it's actually the entire person not just those movement components yeah it, uh, absolutely right and not just the entire person but the caregiver i mean the, that can't be overlooked uh, or overstated, uh, particularly in more advanced stages of the disease. And in incorporating into the thinking of the clinician about how symptoms are not only affecting the patient, but affecting the caregiver is very important. And so um, all that team approach really, in my opinion,
benefits the patient the most because all the different factors are trying to be addressed. You're continuing to think through them over time as the disease evolves and changes. And so putting, trying to put all those pieces together and watching them in a systematic way over time really ends up benefiting both the patient and the caregiver. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Walsh. We're so fortunate to have you as one of our um, physician partners. And, um, you know, you just, it's, it's a wealth of information that you've shared. And um, thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Obviously, this is something that I and, and my colleagues here are very passionate about. And, and although uh, the, the last uh, question was that, that we can't cure the disease, we continue to understand that right now there's over 100 different clinical trials going on in Parkinson's, several of which are specifically designed to see if we can slow the actual accumulation of pathology. Can we actually not just treat symptoms, which is very important, but actually slow the accumulating pathology? And we'll have to see how these trials turn out. But there's real reason to, to be hopeful at the very least that those things are being addressed. Whether that bears fruit remains to be seen, but um, we're, we're actually and actively, including through big pharmaceutical companies who are putting a lot of money and time into this to see if we can slow the process down or perhaps even cure it. And we'll have to see how that does or doesn't bear out over the coming years. Oh, that's great. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, there are clinical trials happening um, in many places. Um, certainly, Barrow has many clinical trials, but you can always go to on the Fox Trial Finder. Um, but staying connected to the clinical trials is really, really important. Um, it's not just a nice opportunity to be able to try something new, but it is it, it, every bit of it, even if they don't end up coming to fruition, you learn something, right, in that process. Absolutely, and that's the key. That's how you learn, and that's how, uh, that's how some of the current clinical trials really got their start, because they're of failed clinical trials before, and they, they failed in very specific ways, and then in further analysis of why some of those trials failed, that actually blossomed into a whole new field of study about synuclein, the main abnormal molecule in Parkinson's, and that led down the field down a path it hadn't been on before that directly resulted in the clinical trials going on right now to help see if we can stop synuclein from spreading. And so that's exactly why clinical trials are important, both the ones that succeed and the ones that fail. Oh, you know, I'm kind of thinking we might have to try to connect on another special lunch with docs just to talk about that clinical trial process. It's one of those things we don't really hear about or understand. Yep, it's and, very important, and, and, and you wouldn't hear about it or understand it, and, and it's important to understand it because then you get an understanding of why it takes so much time, effort, energy, and money uh, to end up getting a new therapeutic agent, and why it's the only path that the FDA allows to developing a new therapeutic agent. You have to have big clinical trials, and the only way you do that is if you have patients involved in them. And so it's always important, and not every trial is right for everyone. You don't need to be in a clinical trial, but know that it's another option, and that's how we advance treatment for the disease. That's fantastic. I will visit with you about that. I'd love to maybe have a, another special lunch with docs about that. There's, there's so much to learn about that process, and, you know, it's hard to get above the noise sometimes um, to really get too accurate information about that. So... Um, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with oh, us. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to me. I hope I didn't bore everybody. Oh my goodness. No, this was great. It was wonderful. So thank you so much for your time. It was really, really wonderful.